Hello Internet, this is kj 4 ips and we continue our server ramblings by talking today about public-private key authentication. But before I begin, I've got a quick apology to make for some mistakes I made last video. First of all, I used the text editor, VRM, a few times and saved and quit without explaining. So for I'm terribly sorry for all the confusion that I may have caused there. Also... I used one command which will vary between which flavor of Linux you're using. I used the yum command to install a package and on some machines that'll be apt get install, on some commands that'll be pacman-s, and on some it'll be zipper, which is spelled really weird. But also I have another slight confession to make. As someone may have noticed, I'm not actually using a real dedicated server using a simple virtual machine and dedicated server is also a really poor name for this you know this is really about linux servers not necessarily dedicated or otherwise you know this is the virtual machine it's booting up i turned it off because i wasn't using it i will let this finish booting so we can connect to it and begin today's a little bit of lesson on public private key authentication so, let's get these out of the way, servers up, and let's go. Now to make our lives a million times easier, we're going to do something here in Putty. Kitty, Kitty and Putty, you see this, you see these saves, and you know, we've already got one for VDaddy here, but I created that last take, so I'm just going to delete that. Yes, multiple takes are a thing. Kitty can be can save and load such special things. For instance, if I want to connect to you know, my home machine really easily, I can just double click it in the list here. You know, I get prompted for a smart card pin. You know, and I'm connected fairly quickly to one of my own machines. Now, this is of course mainly convenience feature. We can do this too with our Videtti. So we're gonna say we are Aaron and we are at Videtti at Hanhaus.org. Gonna call the session Videtti. Well we're not quite gonna save it yet. We're gonna go down here into SSH authentication. Oh sorry not SSH authentication. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're gonna go over here and just use a bigger font for you all sake. I'm going to press save. Now we've got a save session. I can open it. You know, it asks me for my password. You now my last login is displayed. You know, I can always choose Fidetti from here. It just makes life a little easier. So public private key cryptography is a clever way of, of with minimal effort increasing the security of your logins. You know, passwords are not are in the scope of things that a computer can process. Passwords are not very difficult. So often we use something called public-private keys. This involves some very clever math in which we have two big messes of numbers and one is kept secret and one is given to what you're going to log into or other people who want to verify that you have the secret half. Using some very clever math, you can determine which secret half is present. You know, using only the public half, you can prove. You know, someone else who's having only the public half can prove that a message came from someone with the secret half. That's the whole point of them. This whole kind of message passing move is the whole basis for this type of authentication. It also makes simply randomly trying passwords much, much harder, especially if you don't accept passwords at all. So first we're going to create one of these. Putty doesn't ship with a piece of software to do this already. However, the developers of Putty and you know, Kitty is a fork of Putty, which is the first result in Google for me here, provide a piece of software called Putty Gen, which if we download, just like Putty, it doesn't require any type of installation. It's just a run. It makes it look like this. And we can have it generate a key. Get the number of bits in this generate key. I'm going to leave it at 2048. If you're particularly paranoid, you can cramp it up to 4096. 
currently putty and kitty only support rsa and dsa they do not yet support um, elliptic curve cryptography as of this recording so we're going to be using a 2048 bit rsa key these things require a lot of random numbers to create so when we hit this generate i mean putty's going to ask us to move our mouse around up here so that we generate some randomness for it to use and once it's happy it has you know, done this it's created this key this is the public half the private half is actually not displayed and can and the private half is typically encrypted with a passphrase um, we're just going to use the word pass for now because you know, well, this is a demonstration I'm going to save the private key and I'm just going to save it to the desktop over last takes version yeah takes I forgot to clean up after myself and we're going to leave this window running for now we're going to go back to our putty here and we're going to bring up the new session dialog and load our Vedetti session go into SSH auth and we're going to browse to that file we just created and we're going to go back and save our session. So now, note that it tried the key. It said server refused our key. Key was not good. Server didn't like it. You can still log in with password, however. It's not quite as secure. Now, we have to tell SSH on Vedetti about our new key we just made. That's what this, you know, section in PuttyGen for copying is for. So first of all, we're just going to copy this into the clipboard. So there's some there's a special thing we need to do before we do any of this so that the correct permissions are set. Uh, the SSH daemon on the server won't allow you to log in if the permissions on your configuration files for this login are not tight, they are not locked down. So the first thing we're going to do is say umask 077. This means from now on until I either log off or do this command again, Files I create will only be readable by me and no one else. So now I'm going to make a folder with the mkdir folder command. It's going to be named .ssh. SSH. We're going to go into there. Now you notice this file does not show up in our ls. It's because it starts with a dot. We have to use the dash a to show all files and you can see we've already got some that were here when our account was created and if we go into our new dot ssh folder now if we do ls all you notice that the permissions which are listed on the very next, on the far left have a lot of dashes meaning they're fairly restrictive we're going to use the touch command to create an empty file and its name is authorized underscore keys and it has to be named this now we're going to edit that file with our text editor. We're just going to right click to paste after pressing I to enter insert to paste our key into the file. And I have made a typo. So now we're going to talk about the move command. Move moves a file. And now I've moved it so its name is correct. Notice it has those really restrictive permissions again, meaning that only I can read and write them. People in my group can't do anything, and others aren't allowed to do anything at all. So now if I just duplicate, now I can't duplicate the session because it'll send the automatic password, but if I open it again, you'll notice something slightly different happens. It tells me what username I'm using. But now it says authenticating with public key, key name, and our passphrase. And this means that we've talked about, you know, the server and my client have figured out, hey, I have this key. This key is valid, and then the key, the um, client gets ready to send it, looks at, oh, I need a passphrase, and asks for the passphrase. This way, the password's not actually involved. It's all about this key file. And you can have a whole bunch of these in the authorized key file if you want, or you can just use one or two and keep it on a smart card or some other secure storage. Traditionally, you have one key for every workstation that you're using, and then that public key is put on all the servers that you use. There's even a special tool included on most Linux machines called Keyscan to make this easier. Now, this file that PuddyGen created is actually really important that we don't lose this file. We've got one copy of it on this computer, and that's not that good. So we're going to use 321 backup. 321 means we've got three copies, two of which are on different kinds of medium, and one of them is off-site. This is actually surprisingly easy. 
I've got a flash drive lying around on my desk that was a freebie from Loot Crate recently. So, come on, see the flash drive I just plugged in, please. I will try the other USB port because I seem to remember that one's finicky. My device is ready to use. I don't believe you. Free flash drive. Free flash drive is not very good. Nice. I was... Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So, brand new flash drive. This is just me being pedantic and just formatting it for no good reason. Because it's a brand new flash drive and there's probably promotional crap on there and I don't really care to just delete it all. I did check quick format, right? Right? It's apparently also f slightly less than a 4 gig flash drive, but that's kind of normal. There's some weird math between that, that, that will affect this. Come on. Format. Well, we'll get with the offsite first. Offsite's actually really easy. Have it on our desktop. You know what we do? I've got a Dropbox account. So we just, since it's already protected with a passphrase and we assume the passphrase is safe, we're going to copy this to Dropbox. So offsite's done. Our additional medium is still waiting on that format. Jeez. This flash drive got problems. I think this flash drive has problems because this should have taken about 10 seconds. This flash drive has problems. Oh, this might be because it's completely full of dust. <laughs> Format disk. So, let's try that again. Yeah, that's more like it. Pro tip, flash drives full of dust don't work very well. We're just gonna copy our test key there as well. Uh, now we have a backup so that in case this computer dies, this computer, my house burns down and this computer and this flash drive die, I've still got my key. I can get it back from my Dropbox. So we're not screwed. If you don't do this, you can lose the keys and you risk having to call your service provider and tell them to nuke and pave your server or have to pay them for an intervention, have them basically manually break into your machine or some other type of procedure. Often they'll give you a button on their web panel where you can reboot the server to some form of recovery and unbreak it, but yeah. But for right now, we can still log in during passwords, but this still allows people to try and guess passwords, and we don't want that. Not only is it a complete waste of resources, it's kind of not nice. So we're going to use our magic sudo powers to say we're going to assume magic powers now. We're going to edit the file, and we've edited it before, etsy, ssh, sshd config. Now... I have typed the wrong password. Sudo still asks you for your password. I'm going to change this one that says password application from yes to no. We're going to write. I'm going to quit. So now we have made that change. We've got to sudo service shd reload. It means now when we duplicate the session, we're using this key. You can use that private key file on other Windows machines, and PuttyGen can export that to a OpenSSH key if you're wanting to use it on a Linux machine. That's basically all there really is to public key cryptography. You just got to be careful you don't lose that key. Often it's a good idea to make a second key and add it to all the servers you're working on and keep it in a you know safe deposit box or somewhere where it can be used if one of your other keys is lost. And to simply remove a key you just remove it from the authorized key file, which is .ssh authorized keys. 
if you're having issues, you'll want to check the permissions on the um, SSH fold on the authorized key file and the SSH folder. If it's not correct, it won't let you. It's got to be this really restrictive one. This is, um, in magical number terms, this is a 600, and the folder is a 700. If it's any more open, open SSH daemon will not allow the login. You should always keep an SSH session open when you're tr making changes like this. Rest reloading or restarting SSH won't kill active sessions. In case you've managed to lock yourself out, you have a hope that you don't have to call the server company or reboot into recovery or do any of those weird things to recover your system. Well, have a nice day. This has been KJ4IPS rambling on about servers.